church, let's lift our voice together. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's thine ends and pain, I see the stars. True. 
section one time, and then we'll get you to join in with us. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new, oh, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to.
Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Jesus, you are true. You are holy. Jesus, you open doors that no one can shut, and you shut doors that no one can open. God, your glory and your power is amazing. And today, Lord, I just want to say that I worship you. God, help us to remember, help us to know why we give. God, it's because we've been given so much. Lord, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for taking our sin away. Thank you for making us right with you. Thank you for preparing a place for us, God. And when we come, we'll be with you forever. And God, I pray that with that motivation, the motivation of the gospel, Lord, that we would, we would give today for the work of the ministry so the gospel can go all over the world to the people that's never heard. God, to the people that do not have the Bible in their own language. God, help us to spend more. Help us to give more. May we give faithfully today. In Jesus' name. Yeah. 
chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one close to you in the pew in front of you. And I would encourage you to follow along the last book of the Bible so you can turn to the very back and you'll find Revelation. Turn to chapter 3. We'll start looking in verse 7 in just a few moments. Again, if you don't own one, we want you to take that one home with you. That's our gift to you this morning. Guys, I want to tell you something. We're, we're about to embark on the study of Scripture and uh, let me tell you what happens week in and week out, especially this week, because Wednesday night we had a question and answer time about the, the new student center, so I, I didn't have to study for Wednesday night, which gave me a little bit of extra time to study for Sunday. So I've been meditating on this scripture, 7 through 13, all week long, and uh, I'm about to pop. I'm just, uh, I got a lot of stuff to say. I want to tell you that Jesus is Lord. You're not going to go to heaven without Jesus, okay? You're not going to make it. You're not going to get up there and say, I went to church, Lord. I prayed a prayer, Lord. I got baptized. He's going to ask you this, do you know me? And if you don't know, know him, he's going to say, depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. You, you, you may say something like, well, Lord, I did all these things in your name. And he say, I, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. So I want to just encourage you today, know Jesus. Know Jesus. And I, I want us to look at the Word. I want us to pray, and I want God to speak to us. So let's start out by praying, and then we'll go to the Word. Father, thank you, God, for the opportunity to preach. God, thank you for the sweet worship that we've had today. It's been about you, and it's been toward you, God, not toward ourselves. God, we've, we've lifted your name up. We've We've brought up the resurrection in song. We've brought up the, the power, your power in song. And now, God, we go to your word. And God, your word with your spirit accomplishes the impossible, accomplishes the eternal. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would save people today, that you would change us, oh God, that you would make us like you and Lord, I bow my head in reverence and honor toward you, and I say that I'm nothing without you. And God, I need you every single hour. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all know what's amazing about the churches in Revelation? Chapter 2, chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. John is on, island, on an island of Patmos. He's the last living apostle, and God came to him on the island and gave him information to take to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Seven historical churches, which is also a letter to the churches today. 
for me and you. Now, we've been working our way. We're on number six. We only got one more, Laodicea, next week. Remember Laodicea? Remember what God said? He said, you're lukewarm, and I, I just want to spew you out of my mouth. That's next week. But this week, we're actually looking at a positive church, a church that I would call a true church, a church that is faithful, a church that is genuine. So what is so important about the churches of Revelation, what we are supposed to do, and y'all are going to think, well, wow, he went to college for that. It's this. Take the negative, don't do it. Take the positive and practice the positive. Because if you go through those seven churches and you pick out, all right, this is what I'm not supposed to do and here's what I'm supposed to practice, guys, it is a good lesson for spiritual growth in your life and in the life of this church. My question is this, and it's God's statement to us. It's how he ends every letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you've got an ear and you've got a heart to receive, my prayer is that you'll hear what the Spirit is saying to Wade and will obey it. Now, I want to, again, this is a good, the church at Philadelphia, Brotherly Love was a, a church that had everything right. God praises the church and thanks God he commends the church and what we're going to do is say this was the true church because I don't know about you, how do we measure a church? How do you measure a church? Is it the number of people there? Well, my friend, you can get Jimmy Buffett and get a lot of people. That don't make it a church. You can build a lot of buildings and put up a lot of steeples. That don't make it a church. You can get a big budget and big buses. That don't make it a church. But I want to show you this morning, according to the church at Philadelphia, if this is a true church, God, show us. Show us what a true church is and how can Wade be like Philadelphia. Because that's, in essence, what God is saying to us. The, the object of the lesson today is to be like this church. Find the positive and copycat that in a good way, in a spiritual way, in a heartfelt way. So I'm going to give you three things that we need to learn from the church at Philadelphia. Okay, three things that we need to learn from this church. And I want to read the scripture all the way through. No, I'm going to read it as I preach on it, okay? I'm going to read a couple verses and then explain it. So here we go. All right, first off, a true church recognizes Jesus as king. A true church recognizes Jesus as king. And I think that's so important because this author, which is, guess who? Jesus. He introduces himself, and this is how he introduces himself. He says this. He says to the angel or messenger of the church in Philadelphia, write, verse 7, chapter 3, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the, the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. Now that's an introduction of Jesus. And can I go ahead and say something to you this morning really quickly? You don't grow in your faith. You don't grow in your faith by thinking about faith. Do you understand that? Like you don't grow in your faith saying, I need to trust more. As hard as you may try, you may say, you know what, I need to, I need to be more like this person that, that trusts in Jesus more. Let me tell you how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing the word of the living God. In other words, you get a glimpse of Jesus as king, and you'll learn to trust him more. And in this scripture, we'll start to see Jesus describing himself, which I think is amazing. You know, Jesus is the only one, or God's the only one that can write a love letter about himself. Like, how would you like it if you walked up to your spouse and said, hey, I wrote a bunch of songs about me, and I like them. I like them. That's what God did. Book of Psalms, just a bunch of music about him. But there's no pride there. They're all true. God's the only one that can do that. The only one. And here we're, we're getting to a description of Jesus. And I want you to notice that if you are preferring anything above Jesus, that which you are trusting in is defiled and it is an idol. Anything that you're trusting in. So that's the first thing he says, is he said, look, I am the Holy One. This speaks of his purity. This speaks to the fact that if you follow Jesus, he will not lead you into sin. He will lead you in the way of righteousness. Jesus said, I want you to be holy 
Because I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. That's what Jesus said. I am holy. There is none like Jesus. Jesus is holy. Number two, Jesus is true. The fact that Jesus true is true speaks of his reliability. There's two words that John could have used here in the Greek. And the one he used is the one that literally means, listen to this, I like this word. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Listen. All right, one more time. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Okay, just making sure. Listen. He used the word that means reliability. Like, you can trust me. The true one, the holy one, the one who has the key of David. Now, what does he mean by David? The key of David. Well, if you go to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, you'll see that Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, was, he said that uh, he had the key of David. In other words, he could go into David's kingdom, the kingdom, greatest kingdom, one of the greatest kingdoms that's ever been known to this world, and he could go into the accesses of the resources of King David. And Jesus is saying, look, not only am I holy, not only am I true, Jesus said, I am the key. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, Jesus said, look, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is the key. Jesus has the key. And that means everything has been entrusted to him. Do you think you should recognize Jesus as the king? I do. Tell me one thing. Tell me what you're trusting in other than Jesus that's holy. Tell me what you're trusting in other than Jesus that's reliable. Tell me what you're trusting in Jesus, other than Jesus, that is the key. The other thing is, he's unstoppable. He's unstoppable. He said, look, I open and close doors, my friend, and no one, no one can shut them. Or no one, he says, look, if I open a door, it, it's open. If I close a door, it's closed. And nobody can stop me. He, Jesus is unstoppable. That's the fourth thing. Jesus will not fail. Jesus is greater than them all. Let me go ahead and tell you something. If you've got a problem following Jesus, let me, and I tell you this from experience, so don't think I'm trying to judge you. I'm telling you from experience. If you've got a problem being what God's called you to be, it's a heart problem. It's not like a mind problem. Like you don't see Jesus properly. Like you think Jesus is boring and dull and stoppable and he's not the truth. But I want to tell you something. If you understood who Jesus was, the first, if we're going to be a church, guys, we've got to recognize Jesus is the king. William Carey, who was one of the greatest missionaries that ever, ever lived, before he went to India, he had a map, a leather and a paper map made up in his shop. And he had, it was a picture of the, the faraway seas, the whole world. And he ended up in India as a missionary for Jesus Christ. But he talks about this. He said, before he had a, I love this, before he had a vision for the continents, he saw a vision of Jesus. Can I tell you one of the things I think that we're struggling with in the church today? We're trying to do the work of Jesus without Jesus. Like, do this and do that and do this, and you haven't looked at the king you haven't recognized Jesus as the king. Whenever you get a glimpse of Jesus and not understand he is unstoppable, he is the key, he is the truth, and he is the one who is holy, my friend, I want to tell you something. It'll change you. You know what happened to me? Y'all out there saying something happened to you. You know what happened to me? I met Jesus. I used to drink like a fish and cuss like a sailor, but guess what? I met Jesus. I used to spend more time in the yard drinking with my buddies and inside the trailer with my wife and kids. But you know what happened to me? I met Jesus. I saw a glimpse. I recognized Jesus as the Son of the living God, and He changed me. And I want to tell you something. Individually, as a church, we've got to recognize that Jesus is the King because we'll start thinking all this is about us, it's about the style of music I like, about what I want, my preferences and my desires. And I want to tell you something. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. A, God, a church that God uses. I want to tell you something. There's a church that recognizes that Jesus is the King. Hallelujah.
So we got to get off our throne. So I want to ask you again, is what you trust holy? Is what you trust true? Is what you trust unstoppable? Compare the delights that he offers to the passing pleasures of sin. An old preacher used to say one time, he said, if you... He said, if sin ain't fun to you, you're not doing it right. Sin's fun. Pastor, why are you preaching on sin? Because I want to tell you something. It's a bait. It's a trap. It's trying to lead you to death and separation from God. You understand what I'm saying? It's a trap. And whenever you get a proper glimpse of Jesus and you compare it to the passing pleasures of sin that it lasts a little while, but it don't guarantee anything for eternity, you will run to Jesus every single time if you stop and think. Come to the one who is holy and true, who opens and no one can shut, who shuts or closes and no one can open. Come and trust Him. Come and worship the King. Come and worship the King. Number two, you know, have, you, have y'all ever wondered that, or am I just the only I know I'm not the only one. Have you ever wondered, what makes a good church? Is it a good youth program? Is it the, ter- tem- uh, the temperature at 72 degrees? I mean, what makes a good church? According to this, the first thing is, <laughs> Jesus has to be the king. He has to be. Number two, a true church is faithful to the gospel message. A true church is faithful to the gospel message. Look with me in 8 and 9. I know your works. Do you know that Jesus knows your works? He begins just about every letter by saying this. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. And I know that you you have but little power. Some people say that's a negative. I don't believe it's a negative. Why, pastor, do you not think that's a negative? Because I believe what he's saying there, because right after that he says, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I believe, like Paul said, it says, in my weakness I've learned to be made strong by the power of Almighty God. Whenever you look at the Beatitudes of God about being poor in spirit and and rich in the grace of God and, and coming and being humble, I want to just tell you something, my friend. You will not find help from God until you ask for it. You understand what I'm saying? Power comes from you recognizing you are weak, but God is strong. That's where power comes from. And I believe he's not saying something sarcastic here, yet they were little in physical size. Let me just tell you this. You know what God specializes in? God specializes in taking the insignificant, the low life, so to speak, what this world considers, and making them great and do great things for God. Like the little shepherd boy, how does God do that so he gets the glory? Why does God do that? So he gets the glory. Listen to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Nobody's writing books like this anymore. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, Pure in heart, excuse me, for they shall see God. See, humility and smallness and insignificant, according to this world, is God's vehicle for advancing His purposes in the world. The the Lord saw weakness, but He also saw willingness. Like, you don't have to muster up enough strength to go serve God. You just have to step out of the pew. You just got to move. God's just asking you to be faithful. God's just asking you to be willing. Your strength don't even come from you anyway. He's going to give you everything you need that pertains to life and godliness to accomplish His purpose. My strength is made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Behold, verse 9, listen to this. Tell me if this is not crazy. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. These were actual physical Jews, but they were causing persecution on the Christian. Synagogue of Satan is what he called them. Who say that they are Jews and are not. He's saying they're not spiritually Jews, part of the spiritual church. But lie, behold, I will make them come and bow before your feet 
and they shall learn that I have loved you. What do y'all think about when I read that story? I think about Joseph. Remember, and his brothers sold him into slavery. They, they got jealous. Joseph was the favorite. So they took the coat of many colors, dipped it in blood, and took it back to the father, threw him in, or sold him into slavery in Egypt. He went into slavery, worked his way up, and then got falsely accused of uh, immorality, got put in prison. And you're reading this story, and if you've never read it before, what you'll find is you're reading that story and say, this guy can't catch a break. Joseph can't catch a break. Like, why don't God handle this? And then all of a sudden, at the end of the story, or toward the end of the story, you see Joseph's brothers bowing down to him, and they know that God's favor has been upon him. Look, let me just tell you something. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You don't have to go get even. God takes care of it. Hey, tonight, if you don't have anything else better to do, come tonight. Let me tell you what I'm preaching on. Totally amazing. Y'all ready for the title? Are y'all ready? Here's the title for tonight. Lawsuits, Forgiveness, and the Gospel. Preacher, you going to preach on lawsuits? Yep. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Lawsuits, Forgiveness, and the Gospels tonight. Look, we taking each other to court over a foot of property. And you know what God says? Just let them have it. Just let them have it. Why would you rather two brothers go to court? I'm getting sidetracked here. Why would two brothers go to court, an ungodly court system, by the way, and bring it before the whole world, and you're basically showing that two brothers can't even get along? He said, why not rather be just wrong? That's what it said, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All right, going back. The true church is, is faithful to the gospel. Here, here's a couple things really quickly. Number one, a faithful church walks through doors when God opens them. A faithful church walks in God's power. We don't walk in our own power. My friend, I want to tell you something. We don't walk in our own power. What did Jesus tell the church? What did he tell the church? You wait right here till the Holy Spirit comes. Don't you move a muscle or you're going to mess it all up. You wait right here. And then Pentecost happened. And the whole world's never been the same. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Seven times. Glory to God. He said, you wait. We don't operate. A church don't operate in our own wisdom, in our own power. We operate in the power of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit. And we Baptists, we don't like to talk about the Holy Spirit, but He's real. He's the third person of the Trinity, and He's just as much God as the Father or the Son. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Make your will known. Hallelujah. The true church is faithful to the gospel. The faithful church walks in obedience to God's word. Y'all know why they had so many open doors of opportunity? Y'all know why they had so many doors of opportunity? Because they were obedient to the word. It says, because you have kept my word, I will open these doors. Y'all know why? I'm just going to be honest with you. Y'all know why you may not have that many opportunities to share the gospel? It's because you've got to go back and figure out where you were disobedient. Like God's already told you something to do. He said, because you have kept my word. He didn't like give them a reward. It's not like a reward. Don't look at it like that. He saw a group of people that were obedient to the word of God. So what he said, I can entrust them with more stuff, more resources, more opportunities for evangelism and ministry, so I'm going to open the door. My friend, if we want the ministry of Wade Baptist Church, we want the doors to be open like crazy. Y'all know what we need to do? We need to obey Jesus today, and he'll open the door tomorrow. We obey Jesus tomorrow, and he'll open the door the next day and the next day. A faithful church is obedient to God's word. Hallelujah. A faithful church walks in obedience to the word of God. And God swings doors, my friend, open like crazy. I promise you. A faithful church walks unashamed of Jesus. We do not deny the name of Jesus. See, the word of God is powerful. Are you keeping it? Keeping the word of God will not only keep us from denying Jesus' name, have you ever walked away from a situation and said, I should have said something. I should have said it. I should have said the name of Jesus, but I didn't. Keeping the word of God will keep you from denying the name of Jesus, and it would keep you honoring the name of Jesus. Keeping the word of God, not thinking about faith, but thinking about Jesus. The word of God is powerful. 
Listen how powerful it is. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and drink. The third thing is this. See, all right, pastor, I I see where you're going, and I see that you really want to know what a true church looks like, and and you're calling Wade to be a true church. So what does a true church look like? Number one, we have one king, and his name is Jesus. Number one, okay? We got that down pat. Number two, we have a message to tell, and we have to be faithful to the Word of God, so we're faithful to the gospel. All right, number three, are you ready? We work for eternal rewards and not earthly possessions. We work for eternal rewards, the victor's crown, not, can I tell you what real quick? We are the richest people on all the earth. I promise you, if you had a proper worldview, you would see that. And I want to tell you, we are the richest people in all the world. But all we want is more stuff. Let me give you an example really quickly. My, my motor, my boat motor's been in the shop three weeks. I've been calling and bugging the Sioux out of the guy. And he called me this week, and, and he said, I got it fixed. You can come by and pick it up this week. And uh, this, this tells you how my mind works, the flesh. And now that I got my motor fixed, Y'all know what I've been thinking about? Well, I can sell my boat, motor, and trailer and get a little bit bigger one. I finally got it running, and I'm already thinking about selling it. Am I the only one? Always contemplating, how could you upgrade? How could you get a bigger, better house? How could you get a bigger, better car? How could you get more money in that 401k? How can you advance you and your kingdom, and you never think about Jesus and his kingdom? It's all about us. And Jesus said to this church, this church that was working for eternal rewards, here's what he said in verse 10 through 13. Because you have kept my words, my word about patient endurance, notice the three I wills here. I will keep you from the hour hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth, the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Did Did everybody, if you don't hear... One more thing I say, hear this. Jesus is coming quickly. Jesus is coming. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, here it is again, number two. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will, number three, write on him the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Now, what is the new name of Jesus? I don't know, but it's going to be pretty amazing. Why? Because the Scripture says, and I has not seen nor ear heard of things prepared for those who know him and love him. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me, let me bring out some eternal rewards real quick. That we and, and working for can be a play on words. What I mean by this is you're focused on eternal things and the things that's coming to God's faithful, the conquerors. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that fact of if you overcome, your your name will be written in the the book of life. And that, that overcomer, that Christian, a Christian is an overcomer. They've overcome the world. They've overcome Satan and sin and hell by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We're not defeated. We're conquerors. We're victors. And I am a... How many of you really quick? I'm going to get a survey. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Anyway, there's three people in this room as far as the end times, eschatology. There's three different people. Well, maybe four. You may have never even thought about it. All right, listen. You're either a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib person. What does that mean? Y'all know that seven years of heck's coming, right? Tribulation. Three and a half years and three and a half years. The great tribulation's coming. Some people land on a pre-trib Pre-tribulation, you mean the rapture, First Thessalonians, the rapture, the snatching up. That's what the word rapture means, snatching up. That the snatching up is going to take place before the tribulation. That's where I land. Now, there's great Christian scholars that are mid-trib. They believe we're going to go about halfway through the tribulation and be taken up. And then there's post-trib people that believe that we're going to go through the whole tribulation. But, my friend, this is one of the key verses that says that God will deliver us from, not through, from the hour of trial. 
that the whole world will see. Now there is right now in Nicaragua, Somalia, Iraq, Iran, all of these countries, there is terrible persecution. There is Christians being beheaded. There's children being taken out of their home and sold into sex slavery. There's terrible persecution happening because people are Christians. Now, isn't that tribulation? Yes, that's tribulation. But if you look at the scripture, he says there's coming a tribulation for the whole world. But he's going to take us out before that. I believe that with all my heart. Why, Pastor? Why do you believe that? Well, in the first three chapters of Revelation, the church is mentioned 19 times. And from four on, the book to the end of the book, the church is not found on earth. Why? Because I don't believe the church is here. I believe we're with Jesus having a marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Seven times. I believe we're gone. I believe we're with Jesus. Pastor, why? Anywhere you land on pre-trib mid-trib or post-trib or uh, my seminary professor said he was just a um, how did he say it hang on he was a pan-millennialist he just, just believed it was all going to pan out in the end I kind of I agree with that I mean, I, do you have to know just follow Jesus and he'll take you one day but regardless of that who is the one that keeps us safe and secure it's Jesus. He is our protector and he is our provider. Peace and protection. So we work for each other. Can we go ahead and step to that third point uh, on, the, on the screen? There it is. The true church works for e eternal rewards. Now if we can go to the next screen. Protection and peace. Protection and peace. That's what he's saying. He's going to deliver us from the hour of trial that's coming. It's very interesting to know that the church disappears. Why does the church disappear? Do you know that from 4 on in Revelation, basically where I'm about to get to, and I'm probably going to move Revelation to Sunday night or Wednesday night because it gets really deep, but I want to let you know that from 4 on, all craziness is breaking loose. Like you start reading scriptures of crazy stuff. Why? Because that is God's wrath being poured out on all the earth and you know what i think starts at all are you ready you know what's holding back the wrath of god right now from coming on us i believe the church is i believe it's the sweet ladies and men that are praying right now for god's will to be done in their closet and i think as soon as you rapture snatch all of that light all of those god-filled people out of this earth you know what you're going to feel on this earth total darkness have you ever walked down bourbon street and felt the darkness that's what i'm talking about have you ever walked into a room and it felt like the air didn't even was sucked out of the room because there was darkness in the room my friend the only thing that is keeping back the wrath of god is because god's still working through his church and we must be working for eternal rewards and not earthly possessions we work for the, the victor's crown. Keeping the words of Jesus will ensure that no one will lose their reward. Eternal rewards like strength. He said, notice the comparison here. There's a lot of comparisons and contrasts in the scripture. Do you notice the, the people that belong? Y'all know there's only two families, right? Right? There's only two families. You belong to God or you belong to Satan. You're a child of God or you're a child of Satan. Period. That's the way the Bible teaches it. Read First John. Now, the people that belong to Satan here are called, they belong to the synagogue of Satan. But the child of God, the Christian, he said, he will be a pillar. You will be a pillar in my temple. And I'll write my name in the name of the city on you, the new Jerusalem. And you will never depart from it. You will never leave the presence of Almighty God. Imagine the greatest worship service you've ever been in. Imagine the most powerful presence of God you've ever felt. The most in the Holy Spirit you've ever been. And multiply that times a thousand, my friend. And that's what heaven is going to be like every day, 24 hours a day. You'll never depart from that. Now why are you working so hard for other things other than that? Or toward that. You understand? Like your car is going to be a fishing reef. Somebody else is going to be living in your house. Somebody else is going to be dividing up your property and selling it. Look, it's not going to belong to you forever. 
When them kids get a hold of it, just wait and see. Wait and see what happens to that boat and that car and, and that land and that house you've worked so hard and you put all that effort into. It's not going to be forever. The only thing that's forever is what's stored up in heaven. And then there'll be no end to our enjoyment of God's presence. Let's step on down through those, those sub points, Noah. Let me show you, show you these. Come on down. There you go. The victor's crown. Come on down. Strength. And then this is the one I just touched on. No end to our enjoyment of God's presence. No end to it. Like if you get a hold of that, we went to the Home and Grace this past Friday. And Brother Mike Wright preached and we had worship. And there was eight or ten of us went in a church van. And I want to tell you something, it was awesome. We got back in the van and you thought we just won the World Series or something. We just had a great time. We were all... Like a bunch of kids, we were so giddy. We just, we just was in the presence of God and witnessed two men being born again. And we jumped back in the van and we were all just hugging each other and high-fiving. And then I thought about this scripture that I've been studying all week. Like, it's never going to end. Imagine the most peace and the most happiness you've ever had. And imagine that feeling never ending. Like, never. Like, you don't wake up with a headache. You don't worry. There's no more tears. Glory, hallelujah, and we're buying boats and houses and lands. And that's coming. And then we will be God's possession. We will be God's possession because He writes His name on us. Jesus promises all things are infinitely He, the things he has are more enjoyable than what this world has. I've been studying World War II. I just didn't pay attention in school. So now I'm, I'm interested and I'm, I'm watching History Channel. And I'm just fascinated with World War II. This past week I went and seen 1917, the, the movie that's out about World War I. Great movie. But I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated right now with World War II. And one of the things I've learned about World War II, whenever the Nazis, and we were in the bombing campaign, and they would get an order to go, we just wore our pilots out bombing Germany. And whenever they would get word that it's time to get back in the plane, they were wore out. They would give up. I mean, they were ready to give up and just go home, but they fought. Their faithfulness was amazing. Their love for their country was amazing. And whenever they, whenever it came on the intercom and said, enemy pilots are coming or whatever, or get, get ready, hurry, get ready to go to your planes, they came back with an order, or they came back with a statement. And the statement was this. I, I read about this this past week. It said, message received and understood. Message received and understood. That's why God ends all these letters like in verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear. There's no more excuses. Receive the message and understand it. You will not have an excuse. Because I've, I've displayed to you what a true church. You should be like the church at Philadelphia. You should understand that Jesus is your king that you should be faithful to the gospel, and that you should be working for eternal rewards and not earthly possessions. So, what is the main point? Jesus' offer is much better than what this world offers. Do you want to belong to Jesus? Do you want to belong to Jesus? Then obey His Word. Pastor, are you preaching works-based salvation? You know what His Word says about your lost condition? He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not go into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is the true church. You know, here it is, according to this, according to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13, you know how you can tell if this is a true church or not? Is Jesus the king of this church? Do we hold fast to the gospel? And do we work for eternal rewards? 
Now let's take that to a personal level really quickly. You, is Jesus your king? Do you keep his word? Do you keep his word? Are you faithful to the gospel message? And do you work for eternal rewards? Guys, there's some people here that you know it's time. You know it's time. Look at me. You know it's time to be saved. You know Jesus is coming quickly. And you know you've got to get right with him. And you've been putting it off maybe because you're a little older than you think you should be. But I want to tell you something. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. There's some of you here, you know you've been saved maybe 10 years ago, but you've never followed through in believer's baptism. There's somebody here, I believe, this morning that God's tugging at your heart to surrender to the gospel ministry, to be a preacher or a missionary or whatever. You need to come and make it public. Guys, keep his word. Keep his word. Let's pray together. Father, we...